Yes, uh, I would like just to tell that uh, we are now going uh, deeply into the structure of hadrons uh, with uh, Marcus' uh, lectures. Uh, I think uh, Marcus doesn't need a long uh, introduction. He's a very well-known expert uh, in this uh, in this field. Uh, and uh, besides uh, very relevant ideas, uh, he has also written uh, crucial uh, reports. This is my opinion. And uh, all the students uh, start reading uh, Marcus' uh, reports before then entering uh, the field. At least my students do. So it's a pleasure to, to have you here. Thank you. And uh, please. Start. Thank you very much, Sergio, and thank you for this very kind introduction. Um, I look forward uh, to telling you uh, uh, about various aspects of QCD, uh, which are focused on uh, the deep structure of uh, hadrons, that is, uh, the structure of hadrons at uh, fine resolution. And a lot of the lectures will be of how we can uh, understand and handle that regime of QCD using perturbation theory for part of the physics and non-perturbative methods uh, for a different part. So uh, this is the overall plan of the lectures. Um, today, uh, I will spend most of the time uh, on explaining a little bit more about what is behind the running coupling and the running masses in QCD and the ensuing scale dependence of anything you could uh, typically uh, uh, measure uh, and compute uh, using perturbative uh, methods uh, and perturbation theory in my uh, context will also uh, will always mean uh, perturbation theory as an expansion in a small coupling, not uh, the kind of uh, chiral perturbation theory that you heard about just in the last lecture. Uh, in the second part of today, I will then speak about the annihilation uh, of uh, electrons and positrons into hadrons which is in a way the simplest instance where we can apply perturbation theory in QCD uh, to uh, get uh, predictions. Uh, the lecture of Monday will largely be um, focusing on the third part, uh, which is about this crucial uh, concept of factorization and will uh, introduce the concept of parton densities and similar quantities. Uh, the last uh, two days then will come uh, to more specialized topics, uh, one block on parton densities, a little bit about what we know about them, uh, a little bit then about exclusive processes and GPDs. I can be rather short on uh, this uh, part because uh, the lectures uh, uh, that come uh, after my block uh, will uh, go into very uh, big uh, detail here by Barbara uh, Paschini. Uh, same thing holds for transverse momentum dependent distributions. And uh, depending on how much uh, time is left in the last lecture, I will tell you a little bit about my personal hobby horse, which is double parton scattering and double parton distributions. But let's start at the beginning. Here's just a, a small compendium of references uh, for different aspects of these lectures. Uh, most of these are uh, short to mid size. Um, research articles, uh, so you can read them uh, in an afternoon or so, uh, with some ex exceptions uh, for GPDs. This is a field where there are very extensive reviews, several uh, hundred pages uh, here. I've listed a few of them, so uh, this you will not do in an afternoon. And uh, there's this book by John Collins, uh, one of the pioneers uh, of uh, understanding and developing uh, short distance factorizations. So, uh, this is as much detail as you uh, will probably ever want uh, to uh, see and understand. Finally, about the multi-panton interactions, uh, there is a book uh, here, which is a collection of uh, individual uh, articles. Um, you can uh, go to this webpage, uh, which is the webpage of the book, look at the uh, authors and chapters uh, in the book, and you will find then that you, if you look for the title and uh, authors on uh, archive or on uh, Inspire, uh, you have uh, many of these chapters uh, as archive preprints uh, where you can access them individually. Before uh, getting into business, uh, let's take a brief step back uh, and let me make a few uh, generic comments about uh, quantum uh, chromodynamics as we will use it here. Um, is, of course, a theory of interactions between quarks and gluons. And in a way, what makes it most 
different uh, from the weak and electromagnetic interactions is that the coupling, uh, the strong coupling, uh, when it runs, it is large at small momentum scales and small at large momentum scales. And on the one side and the low energy side, that means quarks and gluons are confined inside bound states and uh, you do not see quarks and gluons uh, as uh, free states in nature. On the other side uh, of the energy uh, region, uh, you have a perturbative expansion in alpha s. And uh, this is what most of uh, the present uh, lecture today is concerned with. Uh, symmetries are extremely important in physics uh, and uh, they uh, determine uh, many uh, aspects uh, of a theory. We have in QCD the gauge invariance under the color group, which is SU3. If you want to compare that with electromagnetic interactions, there you have the abelian group uh, U1 uh, and the uh, associated charge is the electric charge. And for many aspects, it's actually useful to make the comparison between QCD with its non-abelian gauge group and QED with this uh, abelian one. There's of course the full uh, group of Lorentz transformations. And on top, there are discrete symmetries, uh, parity that is uh, inversion of all space coordinates, time reversal is a symmetry of QCD and charge conjugation that is replacing particles with the antiparticles is a symmetry of QCD. Um, finally, there's uh, something rather special, which is chiral symmetry, which I don't have to explain to you because uh, you heard a lot of about it just in the previous lecture. Now, QCD doesn't uh, stand for itself. It's embedded in the standard model. And uh, specifically, it is the quarks that couple uh, to the uh, electromagnetic and weak gauge boson as well, uh, bosons as well as uh, to the Higgs particle, uh, given that quarks uh, have a mass. Um, and by the way, um, these individual symmetries, parity, time reversal, and charge conjugation are symmetries of QCD, but they're not symmetries of the full standard model because uh, they are all broken uh, to a different extent by the electroweak sector of the standard model. So that is important to keep in mind. Why would one care about QCD? Well, I think there are different motivations uh, to study QCD. Uh, one is, if you like, very practical. Without a very good understanding of QCD, we would be able to extract very little physics results from LHC, from the searches of new particles there, from studying the properties of the Higgs boson, or from an experiment like Bell, where you look for CP violation, uh, but you do that using uh, mesons uh, and they are strongly interacting bound states. Another line of motivation is that alpha s and the quark masses are fundamental parameters uh, of nature. They are just some of the input into the full standard model. And specifically, uh, there is uh, still uh, a very large uh, program going on uh, of research to try and get as precisely as possible uh, the value of the uh, latest quark that was discovered, the top quark. And that has immediate uh, consequences uh, uh, for uh, larger fits uh, of parameters in the uh, full electroweak sector and for Higgs physics. And also, uh, it is important to understand uh, very precisely the value of alpha s. For example, if you want to run alpha s to very large scales and see uh, and think about possible scenarios of unification of all forces of the standard model into a single one. Last not least, uh, QCD is a very rich theory in itself. One can say it is the one strongly interacting quantum field theory that we can study and experiment at a very, very broad scale. Uh, and there are many interesting and uh, distinct phenomena uh, that uh, are seen in experiment. There's the structure of hadrons, there's confinement, there's the chiral symmetry and its breaking, which uh, you heard about in the previous lecture. There are more mathematical aspects like the convergence of the perturbative series, which uh, is especially uh, uh, in QCD also a practical um, aspect. Uh, so uh, whatever your um, motivation is uh, along this long list, uh, it's good to be aware that there can be other motivations too. And various aspects of the theory, of course, are more, uh, more important for one or the other of these aspects. Now, you've seen the QCD Lagrangian uh, in several lectures before, including the last one. 
so I don't uh, need to carry you uh, through this in detail. What I would like to point out, however, is uh, that there is an index-free uh, notation uh, when it comes uh, to color degrees of freedom, uh, which uh, is often very useful uh, because it allows you to focus on other aspects. Um, and it's also what I will largely use in these lectures. So if I write the QCD Lagrangian in this form, you don't see any uh, open color indices at all. And that is because this here is meant as a vector or matrix notation of uh, all quantities that carry color. The quark field, of course, comes in just three copies, uh, these uh, three colors here corresponding uh, to uh, the color group being SU3. If you had SU2, there would be only two colors. Then there's the covariant derivative here in the quark part of the Lagrangian. It has a standard derivative term and it has uh, the gluon potential. And the way it is written here, the gluon potential is uh, a matrix uh, in this fundamental representation space. So it's a three by three matrix. And uh, the relation of this notation between a notation you might be more familiar with, where uh, the uh, gluon potential has uh, one to uh, eight, an index running from one to eight, uh, is just that uh, you contract uh, these uh, one to eight uh, version of the gluon potential with the corresponding generators uh, of uh, your symmetry group, which are just one half times the Gelman matrices. These happen to be the same. Gelman matrices, uh, uh, of course, that, that uh, you uh, have to uh, work with when you uh, look at SU3, uh, but SU3 as a symmetry in the quark flavor sector between uh, up, down, and strange quarks is the same group, but of course the physics uh, is very different. So what can be done uh, for the gluon potential can be done also uh, for the gluon field strength, uh, which uh, Again, uh, you can either write it in this adjoint uh, representation with eight indices, or you contract it uh, with the generators. And then uh, these here are, uh, as before, uh, matrices in three times three. And uh, one of the exercises uh, that uh, you can do at home and that will be discussed in the tutorials on Monday uh, is to uh, see how you go from this commutator representation uh, to the representation here where you have these explicit structure constants of the theory. Um, at this point, uh, a remark uh, of more general uh, nature, I will uh, have uh, exercises here and there in the lecture slides. The idea of these exercises is uh, they are mostly, with a few exceptions, rather simple calculations. So you might wonder why should you bother? But uh, it's really an experience that uh, if one uh, puts one's hands on something and uh, just uh, does even a little calculation, one just gets a much better feeling for the uh, subject matter. Um, so this is in a sense to immerse yourself a little bit into these uh, things. Uh, and uh, uh, so I really encourage you uh, to uh, look at these exercises as much as you can before the exercise classes, which will come in the mornings uh, then next week. Uh, for the exercise classes, we will ha have the luxury of having two tutors, uh, Peter and Florian, uh, that will allow the uh, classes uh, to be a little bit more interactive because there will be fewer people. That's at least the plan. Uh, I will be absent in the classes because, uh, first of all, I can't be uh, present in two uh, rooms at the same time. And also, uh, the classes are meant really also for you as a chance to go back to basics if you feel like and you should uh, feel uh, perfectly free there to ask any question you think, maybe it's a stupid question. Uh, so uh, the uh, senior guy will not be there and you uh, can really freely talk uh, between people of your age group. Um, finally, uh, the exercises uh, that, uh, as I said, uh, are uh, flagged uh, in the lectures of the slides are always, uh, um, uh, collected at the end of the set of slides there, if you look for this X uh, part here, you find all the exercises formulated out uh, and you are sure that you haven't forgotten any. Um, and uh, the slides that will of course be posted uh, after each lecture on the uh, school's website. So let's carry on. Um, I had on the previous slide, uh, the statement uh, that SU3 is the gauge group. 
So we should understand how uh, the uh, colored fields transform under the gauge group. The uh, quark field, which is this triplet field, with three indices is multiplied by an SU3 matrix. Uh, and the uh, feature that makes this a local gauge transformation is that uh, the SU3 matrix is uh, different, can be different for each point in space time. Likewise, uh, the uh, Covariant derivative here transforms uh, with the same matrix, uh, only that since it's a matrix uh, in three by three space, it gets one U matrix on one side and the U dagger uh, or the inverse matrix on the other side. And the same can then be derived to be true uh, for the field strength. And that is actually a nice thing uh, to see that uh, if you have this behavior, you get that one. Uh, you don't have to work at all if you understand that uh, this lengthy expression here can be written as a commutator just of two, um, uh, two covariant derivatives in this particular way. And uh, this is again uh, worked out a little bit more in the exercises. So with this, let's come now first uh, to uh, the uh, basics of perturbation theory, and then we see how renormalization comes in here. The basics of uh, perturbation theory in a coupling constant is that we split the Lagrangian into its free and interacting parts. And the interaction terms, in simple words, are the terms that come uh, with one or two powers of uh, the coupling constant G, which we had here, and which in this compact notation is hidden inside the covariant derivative and inside the gluon field strength. So uh, having this uh, splitting of the Lagrangian, uh, one can then expand in powers of the coupling constant. Well, whatever uh, you can calculate in perturbation theory, uh, typically that is uh, amplitudes of scattering processes or amplitudes of decays, the corresponding cross sections or decay widths and so on. And uh, a wonderful, uh, vehicle uh, to uh, make uh, this, uh, to, to, uh, to look at the bookkeeping of this expansion are of course Feynman graphs. They visualize the individual terms in the perturbative expansion. And as a prime, they give us a physical picture or intuition uh, of that particular term. So what are the building blocks of Feynman graphs from the free part of the Lagrangian? We get uh, that the uh, propagation of a free quark or a free gluon. And you can actually read these in two different ways. If you work in position space, each of these lines means you have a propagation from one space-time point to a different one. If you think of these in momentum space, and you go always from position to momentum space by a Fourier transform in this context, uh, then uh, this type of line means that you have the propagation of a quark or a gluon with the four momentum k that is fully conjugate uh, in some precise way uh, to these distances uh, at the two ends of the line. Of course, you can have one or the other, but not both interpretations at the same time. The interaction part of the Lagrangian then gives us the elementary vertices in the Feynman rules. And here they are. You get uh, the uh, quark gluon coupling which looks pretty much the same as the quark photon coupling or the electron photon coupling in QED, except that here at the vertex now you have these generators uh, that uh, come in because they are sitting inside here. That is what makes the uh, uh, interaction non-abelian. Then you have the gluon self-coupling, uh, which comes with a term linear in G in the three gluon case and a quadratic term in the four gluon case. And that's all. Now, if you do renormalization, uh, if, if you do, uh, if you compute Feynman graphs uh, be, uh, beyond the lowest order, you find what is called loops. And why they are called loops uh, is fairly obvious if you look at these pictures. And an important uh, thing that you find then is if you write down the expressions of these loops, of these loop graphs using the Feynman rules. Uh, uh, as they stand, the, expression, uh, the expressions are divergent in the ultraviolet. Ultraviolet here just means they are divergent uh, at very large energy momentum components. Or if you work in 
position space, the divergences uh, sit at uh, very small uh, space-time distances. Now, an important result of renormalization theory for QCD is that these uh, divergences only appear in special types of graphs, namely the corrections to the propagators, here the correction of the quark propagator, and in corrections to the elementary vertices uh, of the theory, which I had on the previous slides. Here are some example graphs, some with gluon loops, some with mixed quarks and gluons in the loop, some only with quarks. And another exercise uh, I encourage you uh, to do um, is to draw the remaining one loop graphs for all the propagators and elementary vertices uh, that I haven't already drawn here. So uh, what can you do if you have uh, an expression uh, that uh, is infinite? Well, you have as a physicist, uh, you, you, you need to think why they are infinite. What does that tell you about the physics? As I said, the origin uh, of UV divergences is infinitely large loop momenta or quantum fluctuations at infinitely small space-time distances, as I said. The idea of renormalization is to handle this uh, situation by encapsulating uh, the physics of these UV uh, effects in just a few parameters uh, that become then uh, renormalized parameters of your theory. And these parameters are then uh, used to describe the physics at a given scale, set of uh, momentum scales, uh, which we call renormalization scale. And uh, I'll tell you in the following a little bit more about this. So this is the physics idea. How do we do that technically? That comes in, uh, in different steps. The first step is, well, in order to control what you're computing, uh, you must get rid of these infinities. And that means you regulate the theory, which practically speaking is you make some artificial change of the theory uh, that makes your previously uh, infinite terms finite. Now, a very uh, intuitive type uh, of uh, such an artificial change is to impose a cutoff, an upper cutoff of your uh, uh, energy momentum integrations. In practice, that is uh, feasible uh, at one loop level, but beyond one loop, it gets terribly messy. And the underlying reason for that is that uh, such cutoffs uh, destroy very important symmetries of your theory, uh, Lorentz invariance, gauge invariance. And having lost symmetries into the intermediate stages of a computation, uh, typically is a very heavy price and it's getting very inconvenient. So what one uses in practice is something which is, I would say, the very opposite of physically intuitive and that's dimensional regularization, which has, however, the great advantage of keeping almost all symmetries intact uh, at all intermediate steps of a calculation and that's extremely powerful and valuable. Now, once you have your uh, finite expressions with a regulator, uh, the next thing you do is you absorb these effects of the ultraviolet physics into a handful of quantities. And these are the coupling constant and the quark masses in QCD uh, on top of uh, also the quark and the gluon fields. This is called wave function renormalization, uh, which isn't so important uh, in our context here, so I will no longer speak about it. But if one does calculations, one has to take this into account as well. Once uh, this is done, one takes away this regulator, which after all was sort of an artifice. And uh, then the quantities that are expressed in terms of your renormalized couplings, quark masses and fields are actually finite. Now this uh, program comes with uh, some uh, freedom of choice, uh, namely exactly how much or what to absorb, uh, absorb into the couplings here, uh, sort of put in simple terms, uh, putting an infinity uh, into a coupling constant is as good as uh, putting infinity plus log of four pi. And these choices, of course, affect the finite terms that remain. Uh, and uh, what kind of renormalization scheme one takes depends on the practical uh, considerations, which I won't go too much into here. So uh, let's look a little bit more about dimensional regularization, um, which, by the way, is, of course, not special to QCD. It can be done for the full standard model. Um, and it is, uh, I would say, really the method of choice in high energy physics computations. 
Now, in some way, the choice of a regulator is uh, a choice between different evils. You, have, you cannot just have everything. You cannot uh, typically have all desirable properties. Uh, you have to choose which ones uh, uh, you want. And then on the other side, uh, that will come with certain inconveniences. So uh, the inconveniences of uh, dimensional regularization is that there's little, if any, physics intuition. Uh, but the big advantage is it keeps essential uh, symmetries, this particular the gauge and Lorentz invariance uh, intact, as I already said. So uh, what is the idea of DIMREG? Well, the idea is not so, not so um, uh, difficult to explain. Write down a typical integral for Feynman graphs that is UV um, uh, infinite which uh, is this integral here that would come from uh, a loop graph where you have an incoming momentum P. Take the electronic pen here if I find it. Oops. So we have here, oops. Uh, yeah, this will take me uh, occasionally a while. Uh, so K is the momentum that flows here through this upper part of the loop and P is the momentum that flows into the graph. Um, and then you have two propagators here, the propagator of this one, that's one over K squared minus M squared if the particle has a mass M and here, uh, the other one is k minus p all squared minus m squared. So uh, it's easy to see when k, all components of k get large, uh, this here scales like k to the fourth. And in four dimensions, uh, you have d four k over k to the fourth, and that uh, is logarithmically divergent. However, the same integral, if you were in a three, two, or one dimensional uh, theory, uh, would converge. And that is the idea or the, the principal observation that dimensional regularization is uh, using. So the procedure is now as follows. You formulate your theory in D dimension and sort of you, you have to take D small enough for the integrals that you're looking at to be finite, then you know how to compute. Then you compute this uh, as a function of D and then comes a mathematical part, which is just not very physically intuitive you uh, analytically continue with, uh, these results from integer D where any of this here is quite clear what it should be to complex values of D just by using the theory of analytic continuation and of uh, analytic functions in the complex plane. And then what one finds is that uh, the divergences uh, of such integrals appear as poles in one over epsilon where epsilon in my convention is the difference between uh, D and four uh, divided by two. So positive epsilon means that D is smaller than four and that the ultraviolet divergences disappear. Once you have that, you renormalize as I described on the previous slide. And after that, you take the regulator away, which in this case means you set epsilon to zero. Uh, renormalizing highs means uh, specifically you here, uh, in the quantities you have computed, you have to take away at least these poles because these are the terms uh, that prevent you from taking the limit epsilon to zero. Now, let's see a little bit more in uh, detail how these uh, poles arise in an actual calculation. And I don't know why this pen is in the moment not my friend. Ah, here it is. So somehow it loses the focus at times. Uh, so as I said, this here is an archetypal uh, uh, example of loop integral. And let's just see how it behaves in the ultraviolet. Now it is with uh, a little bit of knowledge of special functions, gamma functions, and a bit of knowledge of field theory, rather simple to compute this uh, exactly in D dimensions. And you will find that being done in many field theory books. What I want to show you here is uh, to uh, take away all non-essential parts of this problem and show you in a very pedestrian way how these poles arise, because I think that's uh, rather uh, instructive and a bit amusing too. 
So the first thing we do is we uh, just look at the large K region, which is the ultraviolet region. And then, as I said already, uh, you neglect the mask and that with K squared, you can neglect P, which is an incoming momentum and therefore finite uh, with respect to the much larger values of K and you get a K to the four here. And of course, that is only valid uh, for the ultraviolet part. So we say this uh, is the ultraviolet part, which we specify to be bigger than some cutoff value here. So how can we uh, simplify this further? We are not interested here in the angular part of the integration because the uh, um, infinities uh, at d equal four come from this integral over the size of k. So let's just reduce that to the one dimensional integral that is uh, relevant here. And then we get uh, here just dk of k to the d minus one instead of d dk. And uh, the proportionality factor here is just uh, the angular part of the integral, uh, which uh, is finite in any dimension d, and therefore not of relevance uh, for what we are uh, after. Now, this is an integral which you can do uh, at your breakfast table. It's elementary. And here is what you get. That's the result. And of course, as I said before, for that to be true, d needs to be smaller than 4. Now, if I use this uh, uh, parameter epsilon I introduced before, d is equal to 4 minus 2 epsilon, uh, then this here just turns into 1 over 2 epsilon k naught to the minus 2 epsilon. Now, uh, in order to uh, treat this further, it's useful to expand everything in epsilon. And uh, before we can do that, uh, we have to uh, repair the mass dimension here. So this is uh, a fractional dimension uh, in a power. And that's uh, kind of inconvenient because k0 is, has a mass dimension. It has the dimension of a momentum. So what can we do? Well, we can multiply this with some mass parameter, which I'll tell you more about on the next slide, uh, elevated to the appropriate uh, power, such that after this, uh, we just have here a ratio of two momentum parameters, mu over k0. And now we have a fractional power of, sorry, this here is meant to be a mu, a bit ugly. Yeah very ugly actually, so let me try this erasure. Uh, this is something we can now uh, work with further. We can write that, for example, if you were very detailed as the exponential of two epsilon times the log of mu over k naught and now this, we know how to tailor expand. Just use the exponential series. And we get one over two epsilon from the first part of the expansion of the exponential, which gives you one. And then the next term is two epsilon by two epsilon times the log of mu over k naught. And the next term is of order epsilon and will disappear when we take uh, epsilon to zero. So you see what happens. Uh, this is uh, this pole in uh, epsilon that I announced before, and it comes in really in a very simple way. And from uh, Taylor expanding the remaining part of the uh, integral result, uh, you get, and that's very important in the following, you get a logarithm between two scales. The scale, which in this uh, simple example here was my cutoff scale, where sort of the, I, I, I wanted to uh, the ultraviolet part to start and an extra mass scale, which I, for the moment, pulled out of my hat. Now, the next step is to understand uh, how I could pull that uh, out of my hat. 
And that uh, is the following story. If you look at the uh, coupling uh, G in our four minus two dimensional theory, you find it is actually not dimensionless. It has a mass dimension itself. And the convention then is to write the coupling not as G, but as mu to the epsilon times G, such that G is a dimensionless parameter. And mu is then just a mass scale which you cannot avoid uh, from appearing. And uh, the fact that the coupling in uh, this uh, theory actually has this mass dimension epsilon is again rather uh, instructive to see. And that's one of the exercises uh, that you find at the end uh, here. Now you might think, well, that's kind of a, a crazy uh, feature of my dimensional regularization. But in fact, it is not. Turns out if you uh, think of other regulating schemes, uh, you always integrate, uh, introduce a mass uh, scale uh, one way or another. And the most obvious way uh, to actually introduce a mass scale is if you work in a cutoff scheme, because the cutoff on momentum is of course, again, a mass parameter. And many other uh, schemes like pauli villar schemes where you introduce fictitious particles with a large mass, again, have a mass. So the upshot of this is renormalized quantities, the ones where I've taken away the poles and maybe some finite terms in order to make the rest look pretty, uh, they depend on this scale mu. And you see here in a very simple setting uh, how this scale mu appears. And you also see that it comes in almost automatically uh, from uh, in the form under a logarithm. So that brings us out of the um, kitchen into uh, the area of some uh, results, which I will not be able to show you here in detail. If one uh, works harder, that's the object of a field theory course, you can derive uh, what is the dependence of renormalized couplings and masses on your renormalization scale. And that has this uh, form here. Um, it is given by a function which, if alpha s is small and you can uh, use perturbation theory in alpha s, uh, is uh, computable. If you're interested in this function for large values of alpha, where you cannot use perturbation theory, then you have to resort to non-perturbative uh, methods and that is actually be done, for example, uh, using lattice uh, QCD, but I will not speak about that in this lecture here. So these are perturbatively calculable functions. And uh, there's been an enormous efforts over several decades to compute these uh, to high order. Um, my notation for the coefficients in this expansion is like such, beta is negative, starts with a coefficient times alpha s squared, and then the remainder of the series I write in this form uh, simply because it is practical for the uh, little calculations I want to show you in the, few, uh, in the following slides. This uh, quantity gamma m here is called the mass anomalous dimensions for historical reasons that I don't want to explain here. Um, and it has a similar expansion only that it starts at order alpha s rather than alpha s squared. And this function here very uh, um, imaginative imaginatively is called the beta function, surprise. The, uh, in both cases, we know the coefficients up uh, to the fourth order beyond the tr first uh, trivial one. Um, the lowest order uh, expressions uh, nicely fit on the slide. NF is the number of flavors. And how that comes into uh, such calculations is easy to uh, guess, because some of, your, uh, of the loop integrals that you have to uh, renormalize uh, have internal fermion loops. And here you just have as many fermions as you have fermion flavors. And that's why NF appears in these renormalized quantities and their uh, beta function. At higher orders, also the mass dimension, uh, the mass enormous dimension depends on NF. So this tells us that alpha s as a function of your renormalization scale runs. It changes. And the way it changes, you can compute if you uh, know the beta functions, uh, the, the beta function. The beta function of QCD is negative, and that is what it distinguishes QCD uh, from uh, the electroweak sector in which uh, the beta functions are positive. Uh, so the electroweak couplings become bigger for bigger masses. And uh, the uh, 
strong coupling becomes smaller for larger scales. In turn, it blows up if you go to small scales. The lowest uh, data points here are from uh, the decay of the tau lepton into hadrons. Uh, and you see this as an expansion parameter is already stretching your luck quite a bit. So in order to have anything halfway precise, you have to go to very high orders here at the very minimum. And this is a beautiful confirmation of a theoretical prediction, because as I told you, uh, the shape of this curve, although not its initial value, uh, can be computed by computing the beta function. There's also a nice uh, thing here. This is the progress in experiments and the accompanying theory. Uh, that is the latest compilation of results uh, in the review of particle properties uh, data of this year. And you find this review of particle properties online. It's really a treasure trove of information. And I can only uh, um, recommend you uh, to uh, look at this website, look at what's there. There's many mini reviews, many nice plots. Uh, it's a beautiful source of information. It's nicely packaged into small pieces so you can look at one every Friday afternoon uh, before the weekend. This was the state of our knowledge uh, back in 2003. And you see, it's really impressive how much uh, experiment and theory have progressed since then. But the value for the tau decay point here roughly was right already that time. So, I said you can compute the running of alpha if you uh, compute the beta function coefficients and solve uh, the renormalization group equation. And that is one way of writing uh, the solution of that equation uh, to what is called the next to leading order uh, truncation. Now, truncating the beta function, leading order would be just this minus B0 alpha S squared, gives you leading order and Keeping one extra term, it gives you what is called the next leading order. And uh, to uh, derive this form here uh, is one of the exercises again. That's a little bit more uh, work, but uh, conceptually it's quite easy. Uh, and in the exercises section uh, back there, there is a hint of how you can get that rather easily. Now, what you see here is that you have this logarithm of your scale mu squared divided by some scale which is called conventionally lambda QCD or lambda. Uh, and that is a very remarkable thing because that mass scale uh, is not something you find in the QCD Lagrangian. The only mass parameters in the QCD Lagrangian are the quark masses. And this has nothing to do with the quark masses. In fact, you would have this uh, type of mass scale appear even if you had a hypothetical theory with zero quark flavors, no quark masses, and just the gluons. And that there is a mass scale popping up here uh, is also sometimes called dimensional transmutation. Sounds a bit um, uh, weird, but the idea is you start with a Lagrangian that has no mass scale, but due to quantum effects, which come in technically through this renormalization program I uh, explained to you briefly, uh, in the end, there is a mass scale uh, appearing which you can also say is a fundamental parameter of the theory. So this is quite remarkable. Now, let me show a little bit more to you how you can actually solve this uh, uh, very important uh, differential equation, which is the uh, renormalization group equation for alpha s. So I'll try again to work uh, with uh, this pen here. The first step here uh, is uh, to invert uh, the functional dependence and to understand mu as a function of alpha s rather than the other way around. Now you've seen on the previous plots, uh, that's a monotonic function. So there's no problem in inverting it. And what you then get, well, you just rewrite this here, your new differential equation is d log mu squared of alpha s by d alpha s is one over beta alpha s. And that's very simple because that's a, a differential equation that you can uh, straight away solve by 
integration. So one way of writing that is, well, if I take my final scale, I call it mu squared. The other scale I call q squared for reasons that are not so obvious now, but it will be just convenient a little bit later. Then from the line above, I get, well, it's just the integral from alpha s at the lower scale to alpha s at the higher scale of the alpha over beta of alpha. And uh, if you uh, put in a perturbative expansion of your beta function here, you are in business, you can compute this. And let's just see uh, what that gives. Um, at leading order, start with the simplest, uh, we uh, have here just minus B0 times alpha squared. That's a super simple integral to do. And the result is one over this B0 and then D alpha by alpha squared gives you uh, one over alpha for the uh, root. And then you take this at the one scale minus the same thing at the other scale, corresponding to the boundaries of this integral here. So that was simple. And um, before discussing this further, uh, let's do something uh, 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 special, which is considering, um, hang on, I have to look something up in my notes. Uh, let's consider the case in which the logarithm of mu squared over q squared is not too large and not too large means it's not too large compared with the inverse of alpha s which stands here on the other side. The b0 here counts as a coefficient of order one and if you plug in the numbers for this b0 it was given on the previous slide uh, for typical values of uh, nf uh, you see it is indeed a parameter of order one. So it's just trying to uh, count powers of alpha s here. Um, if uh, you um, make this approximation, then you can uh, simplify this here in the following um, way. Let's first rewrite it. Well, the, the first step is still generically true. Just reorder uh, this equation. And what we get is uh, alpha s of q squared is alpha s of mu divided by, that's just reshuffling, one minus alpha s of mu, b0 log mu squared over q squared. So this is still exact, follows from the line here. If this log times alpha s is small, then I can, uh, uh, expand uh, this here uh, in alpha s using the geometric series. And then what I get is alpha s times one. And then I get the plus, now I have to continue on the next line, alpha s mu squared b naught log mu squared over q squared plus order alpha s squared. Now, why don't I bother to write down uh, the order alpha s squared term here? That's because it would be rather pointless. I have uh, obtained uh, the result up here from a leading order truncation of the beta function. And if I were to expand this beta function further, I would have more terms up here. And these terms would generate also other terms of order alpha squared here. So keeping the alpha squared part uh, in this approximation is actually going beyond the accuracy of what you have anyway. Uh, so this is the point at which you should truncate. And how do you know at which point you should truncate? Well, either uh, you uh, just take one more order here and see that it is uh, giving you terms of order alpha s squared here, 
or you follow the rule of thumb if you wish. Uh, if you have a leading order term, then in the expansions, you should take the first term beyond the trivial one. And the trivial one is here, uh, the alpha s. And I just realized that was not so good. Alpha s here needs to be evaluated, of course, at the scale mu squared. So I'm not pretending that these slides will be any uh, beauty contest, but I hope you can read them nevertheless. So this is a, an important result. You can express alpha at one scale in terms of alpha at another scale by a perturbative expansion. And there's a trivial term here. So at leading, at, at, at lowest order, alpha s at one scale is equal to alpha s at any other scale. And the first correction to that comes from the first beta function coefficient is d0, uh, and it has this form, and it comes with a log of the ratio of scales. Of course, if this log is very large, such that this term here is much bigger than one, then it's easy to see because this was a geometric series here, then the higher order terms are much bigger than what you have here, and the expansion is no good, and you would have to use this form here. So that's a, a generic way of handling uh, such um, uh, calculations, you always have to make uh, sure you understand what is the order that you're looking for, what is the accuracy of your calculation, and the rest is essentially Taylor expansion. So the maths behind it is really very, very simple. But let's now look at this uh, lambda QCD parameter. And uh, how does that come in? Well, uh, let's go back for this uh, to this uh, line here. You could understand this alpha s at q as your initial condition for computing alpha s at your desired scale mu. What if I take a crazy initial condition uh, as the point at which alpha s uh, is equal to infinity, which is sort of the point where you would sort of hit uh, the uh, ceiling uh, going back with this curve, just as it is given to you by perturbation theory. And uh, one should uh, mention at this point, this is a mathematical procedure because we know physically speaking, uh, if you go uh, to a region where alpha s is very, very large, then uh, the first step of your equation here, which was truncating, truncating the beta function uh, wasn't good at all. But uh, at the moment we are just manipulating mathematically this leading order expression. And therefore what I do in the following is legitimate. And that is, now oh, let's see if I can find again my pen here. Where is it? There it is. So, then on this previous slide, second line, uh, this minus one over alpha s of q just disappears because it's one minus one over infinity. And then the, solution of my equation is very simple indeed. It's alpha s at mu is equal to one over b0. You always see this uh, uh, coefficient of the beta function times the log of mu squared over lambda squared. Uh, this is the lambda QCD that you had on the slide. I'm just too uh, lazy to write the QCD uh, subscript here. And this is uh, another way to see how this transmutation, uh, this dimensional transmutation happens. Uh, it comes in this uh, disguise here as uh, the scale at which you take a particular boundary condition of your differential equation for the running. You could have taken any other boundary, but it's inevitable to take some boundary value, of course. So let's see uh, how this goes if we uh, go beyond the leading order in the beta function expansion, then we have beta equal minus B naught alpha S squared one plus the next coefficient here is this B one, which is again a function of NF and uh, you can look it up in books if you're interested, times alpha S and we neglect the higher order. So this is now the next to leading order accuracy and what one does then is one uh, can write uh, the uh, equation like such. 
Uh, sorry, there's one square here. There's a step. The generic way of doing what I had in the first line here is to integrate from initial condition alpha is equal to infinity. That's what we had here up to alpha s at the scale mu squared. Or at the scale mu, I might write mu once, uh, one time and mu squared other times. Uh, will give me that little bit of sloppiness. And here, so at any order in the truncation, you can define lambda squared uh, or lambda in this way. It turns out it's useful to modify that just a little bit by adding here uh, something which looks like an integration uh, constant, if you wish, and which practically means just if you had first this definition without the delta, and then you add the delta, it just means that your lambda parameter get multiplied uh, by uh, some number. So you can see it as a scheme. And why? Well, it is useful uh, to have this uh, value delta here. Uh, I will, uh, you will see in the exercises, it just makes uh, the solution of the equation look more pretty. But it's a legitimate choice. And if the choice makes things look more pretty, uh, they're perfectly good choices. So if we take this next to leading order expansion here, well, just plug that into the beta function, do the integral. I tell you here uh, what uh, the integral looks like. So you get the alpha s, and I don't write the mu squared on the other side here, just for, again, for brevity, uh, there's only alpha s around, one alpha s uh, uh, mu squared around at this point, so there is no ambiguity. And doing the integral with your preferred table of integrals uh, or your preferred computing tool gives you this. So here comes this coefficient beta one, which was absent at leading order. So this is just doing the integral after plugging in the NLO form of beta here. And you see, of course, setting beta equal uh, B one equal to zero, which corresponds to the leading order beta function, you are back to what we had before. If you keep this, well, we're almost there. Uh, I forgot the plus delta here. Um, turns out, what do we have? We have a leading term here. We have a next to leading uh, term here because if alpha s is small, then this is much bigger than uh, this here. And we have one higher order term, which is itself, of course, because the log has a Taylor expansion around argument uh, zero, uh, around argument one. This is of order alpha s. And that is a term which is actually beyond the accuracy of the computation, the same spirit that I mentioned before, because if you look uh, more closely, uh, keeping the alpha s squared term here will also give you terms of order alpha s there. And therefore, it is pointless to retain this term. So the consistent truncation of this is to stop here. And that gives us now uh, a new um, representation of the running uh, alpha s at NLO, which I'll just write down here. So that's this B0 log mu squared over lambda squared minus, so I'm just reshuffling uh, what is written in the previous line. And I'm restoring the mu minus B0 delta plus order alpha s and I explained to you why I don't keep that order alpha s. And here we have basically the solution of uh, the RGE at next to leading order. Now it's not yet written in the form alpha s of mu equals something as a function of mu because it's an implicit solution here. But uh, you now have two choices. Either you take just a numerical algorithm uh, that finds the root of this equation and gives you alpha s of mu for a given value of mu. And numerically, that's a very simple exercise. They're very powerful and simple algorithms to do that. Uh, and that's what's then often done in practice. 
Uh, another uh, possibility is to solve this here analytically uh, in an expansion, because you are doing an expansion anyway, so you might as well go on with the expansion. And how that is done uh, will be shown in the exercises. And it gives you this equation for the running of alpha s that I had on the slide here. So this is how it goes. And now let's uh, look a little bit at what that implies. But I see now we are uh, an hour into the lecture. And Sergio uh, told me I should uh, give ourselves a little pause. So here's our little pause. At this point, are there any questions you would like to ask? Anything that was terribly obscure, let me know now. Does not seem to be the case. Sergio? Well, it was it was very clear, very detailed. But uh, please ask questions if uh, you have doubts. Okay, somebody says writing that everything is clear. Victor? And anyway, any question that comes to your mind afterwards, you can still ask either at the end of the lectures here or in the exercise classes. Of course, Peter of course. and Florian will be very happy uh, to sure. do their part of the wisdom. Now, before going on, I suggest we make a three minutes break uh, for me to have a cup of tea for everyone else to stretch their legs a little bit. Uh, but please be back uh, at uh, 1720. Is that fine? Great. Perfect. Very good. Hi, I have a bit of a nitty gritty question about dimensional regularization that I'd like to discuss okay. briefly if possible. Please go ahead. Uh, it occurs to me that, if, I mean, okay, so you've, you've treated some denominator, which is just, you know, it includes the square of some Bohr momentum or something of the sort. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say that you have some integral where you have some Dirac algebra element in the numerator, for example. Yes. How does one go about treating such, a, such an object in dimensional regularization, um, given that uh, the, the structure of the Dirac algebra like changes uh depending on the dimension that one is using yes very good question the short answer is that for many things there it, it it's not a big complication you just have to basically extend the dirac algebra uh, and what one does is that the extension um is such that this fundamental rule of computation which is the anti-commutation relation between two uh, uh, of the fundamental gamma matrices here, stays correct in D dimensions. That gives you a lot of mileage. And for many QCD problems, that's all you need. So you have to adjust uh, your computation of traces, uh, where in places where in D dimensions you have uh, certain factors of four, you will then have factors of D, uh, and that's again all worked out and also in the appendices of uh, corresponding books. The one thing that is not simple at all is how to treat the gamma five matrix in D dimensions. And that, uh, so that is a long story I cannot uh, tell you here uh, to consistently uh, incorporate the gamma five matrix in D dimensions uh, is, uh, not so easy because you cannot keep all the properties of gamma five uh, that you are using in four dimensions. And there's physics behind this apparently technical detail. Um, you have seen in uh, the previous lecture that the gamma five matrix is essential when you discuss uh, chiral symmetry because the projectors on chiral even and chiral odd states or left and right handed states uh, involve the gamma five matrix. And the fact that this is not so easy in uh, the renormalized uh, theory, if you introduce a regulator, has to do with the fact that chiral invariance is broken by quantum effects. The buzzword for that is uh, an anomaly, and in that case, it's the chiral anomaly. And you see it technically 
by the difficulty of uh, defining gamma five in D dimensions, you might wonder, well, again, why do you bother with such a crazy scheme if it gives you trouble? Turns out the uh, breaking of chiral symmetry uh, is a physics. And if you take any other scheme, you will find again that chiral invariance is broken. So there's no way around it. Does that help a little bit? Yes. Good. Uh, I, I guess it wasn't, uh, I guess at least what springs to mind about the about gamma five is that either you you keep the uh, you keep it being the pseudo scalar or you keep it anti commuting. Yeah, with, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. gamma so matrix. you have again to choose in that case which uh, property do you retain, which one do you give up, uh, and you cannot keep them all. And depending on how you do it, you have then again what is called different schemes. But uh, that's really a, a very uh, interesting chapter by itself, which, however, I won't have time to cover here. So let's come back uh, to uh, the running of, uh, well, anything. If you by the way, just thank you. Yeah, welcome. If you compute something in perturbation theory, as I said, you have a depends on the renormalization scale, and it comes in two different ways. It comes implicitly because the expansion parameter of perturbation theory depends now on you, the renormalized one. And it comes explicitly by terms uh, that are logarithms of uh, the mu scale divided by a relevant scale in your computation. So what that Q is depends on what you compute. If you produce, for example, uh, particles with high uh, transverse momentum uh, PT, and that here would be a kind of scattering graph. Imagine these two gluons coming out of one and another proton. They can scatter, produce you high PT uh, particles. And here you have a loop, uh, calculation, uh, a loop. So if you uh, compute this, you will find that the, the log here can be written as the log of mu over the PT in the final state. If you have a decay like Higgs decay to hadrons, then the Higgs mass is your mass parameter. If you uh, annihilate E plus E minus into hadrons, then the center of mass is your uh, high scale. So the simplest setup is where you have a single high scale, then it's kind of clear what uh, the scale here is in your logarithms. If you have uh, scales with several uh, large parameters like high PT, but with a massive quark, then what happens here depends really on the case. Uh, and uh, one cannot say much more uh, on a generic, uh, at a generic level. Now comes an extremely important uh, sentence here. The mu dependence of an observable cannot be there because mu was sort of a way of formulating the theory uh, but what mu should be, what should be the value of mu is not prescribed. Yeah? More uh, specifically, the mu dependence of an observable you compute in perturbation theory must cancel beyond the accuracy of the computation. Uh, we've seen before in the little examples I uh, showed you uh, in a little calculation, at some point you truncate your result, higher orders that you cannot compute at that point, and these higher orders are allowed to depend on the scale uh, because uh, that dependence is beyond uh, the accuracy of what you're doing. And that's exactly how it happens. Now, let's see how that happens uh, uh, in a kind of uh, sandbox example. Consider some uh, physics problem without running masses so that the only thing that runs is alpha s. And uh, the observer that has a single scale q and then we have an expansion of that observable in terms of alpha s. And I can first expand uh, in alpha s at my physics scale q. That's certainly uh, a choice that makes uh, some sense. And I write the expansion like such, the coefficient of the leading term uh, is called c0. And then there is a next to leading order term with a coefficient c1 and another power of alpha s at my uh, scale q and higher orders, which I don't consider here. I'm keeping uh, this here generic. Some observables uh, start at alpha s to the zero. And we'll see an example later on today. Others uh, start at some power uh, which is bigger than zero. And uh, you can see what happens and you will see it in a moment. 
So what can we do with this uh, to understand about the mu dependence uh, if instead of alpha s uh, renormalized at the scale q, I take another scale mu. Well, in order to see what happens, uh, I just have to go back a few slides where I had by some uh, lucky accident computed alpha s uh, at scale q in terms of alpha s at another scale mu. That's why also I took the uh, notation at the time. Now you can go back yourself uh, later on to that slide and see what it was. I am now expanding that to the nth power because that's what I need here for the first term. And then there was this one plus alpha s of mu b0 beta function coefficient log of the scale ratio mu squared over q squared plus higher orders. And since I'm uh, now taking this to the nth power, um, I get another uh, factor n here in front. And that is actually uh, an important uh, observation, but okay, let, let's make that in a second. If I now just take this here and plug it in the first line, what do I get? Really, you, you see the, the maths in this is all extremely simple. The tricky part is to understand what you're actually doing. So now we have uh, first term is alpha s n mu from plugging in the first term here. And then, so am I taking this out? First term is C0, just my leading order uh, result coefficient there. Then I get, well, here uh, another alpha s mu times the C1 coefficient. And since this here is alpha s, uh, I've traded alpha s q for alpha s mu, there's a correction to that, but that correction is of order alpha s squared inside my brackets here. And I've already uh, neglected alpha s squared terms here, so I don't have to keep that correction. In fact, I shouldn't because it would be going again beyond the accuracy of what I'm doing. And then there is another term which I need to keep that comes from the leading order C0 term multiplied with the first correction to the running here. So then there is another alpha s of mu times C0 coming here and times this uh, whole uh, stuff, that's n times b naught log of q squared over uh, mu squared over q squared. And again, let me write it out here explicitly higher orders are of order alpha s squared inside the uh, brackets here. So that was a simple uh, calculation, but there is an important message in it. You see explicitly, now if you uh, expand uh, around uh, mu not equal q, but another value, you have more terms, but the extra terms uh, are fully determined by the lower order coefficient here, and the running of alpha s. And that is clear once you uh, look at how the calculation here was done. Yeah? And you can take this one order higher, then you have, will have uh, terms uh, at order alpha s squared, which involve, of course, one term comes with a true two loop coefficient here, the C2 it would be. And then you have more terms that come from the running alpha s. Uh, one will be just uh, the next order uh, uh, in this uh, uh, expansion here that will have a log squared and a B0. And another uh, term will have the B1 coefficient uh, from also uh, making that uh, here more precise to the next order. And so it goes on. One can really see uh, rather easily uh, what is the uh, um, general pattern in this expansion. Little side remark, you also see if your uh, lowest order starts with a high power, the higher that power is, the higher the logarithmic correction here is, which just comes from this uh, uh, binomial expansion here. So also uh, that is very important. What else did I want to say? Um, I think this is uh, taken here again. So that's the same thing, just written in a nicer way. 
uh, little ex uh, exercises check that this year satisfies uh, what I claimed in words before. The scale dependence of the observable is of an order in alpha s, which is beyond uh, the accuracy of what I've computed. But of course, when you do the computation, you will not find that uh, the scale dependence is absent. It's just of a size that you shouldn't be surprised about. That's very important. Now, what is a reasonable choice of your scale mu? Uh, that you can see here. You don't want to have mu too different from q squared, because if this here is a very large number, this logarithm, uh, then you have a very big correction term here uh, compared with uh, the uh, previous order. You might say, well, I don't care. But what you should care about is that you know there is even higher orders, which you have neglected. They come with even higher powers of the log. And that's not good, because that means uh, your truncated series uh, is no longer uh, giving you a good uh, approximation in that case. So what you uh, want to make sure is that essentially alpha s times this log of scales is not too large, should be a small number, just as alpha s is a small number. Now, details depend on what these coefficients are, what n is. Uh, so what is a tolerable uh, range of uh, mu squared being different from q? Uh, that is something that uh, you cannot uh, answer uh, in a generic way, but you can look at examples. So let's look at an example, and it's a very interesting example. Um, the uh, decay of a Higgs boson. Now, a Higgs boson uh, couples very strongly to the top quark. And by this top quark loop, you can then uh, produce final states that uh, consist of, well, quarks and gluons, if you do perturbation theory, hadrons in reality. And uh, what is shown here is the perturbative calculation of Higgs uh, going uh, to partons via a top quark loop. Now, there is also a direct coupling of the Higgs to the B quark that would give you uh, additional contributions. Uh, but that is small compared with the top quark coupling because the couplings are proportional to the mass. Uh, if you are interested in high precision, you take it to, into account. It's just not included in what is shown here. Now, this type of uh, uh, decay has been computed again to very high order, namely uh, the third uh, order beyond uh, the leading one. And when you have computed this, uh, you have all these coefficients here and the logarithms at the higher orders, and you can just plot your result. So the observable C in this case is equal uh, to the partial decay width for Higgs going uh, to hadrons. And this is what you get at leading order. Well, you have a very uncertain result, depending on what the ratio between uh, your renormalization scale and the Higgs mass is taken to be, uh, well, you would say, hmm, maybe mu of order M Higgs is a natural scale choice. So let's look at here. Let's look a little bit to the left and the right. It's a big uncertainty. And oh, goodness. If you look at the next highest order, you see you were actually quite off a little bit with your guess that this was a good scale choice. Because the next leading order curve here is the uh, green one. It still is rather steep and actually doesn't intersect uh, the leading order curve in this uh, window of uh, ratios here. So you see this uh, is not very satisfactory either. You should actually go to the next to next to leading order, and that's the blue curve. And therefore, the first time you see, aha, uh, that doesn't uh, really change too much anymore. So you could say, what I choose for my scale here doesn't matter too much. And it turns out if you go one order higher, and only very strong loop calculators can do that, uh, you find that if you had made a call it reasonable choice of the scale here, uh, the next to leading order uh, lets you keep uh, to stay uh, in the same ballpark. Uh, and that uh, is, uh, looks like a convergent situation. You can reasonably hope that the even next highest order here gives you a small correction, uh, but it doesn't shift you around by a factor of two uh, as it happened, or a factor of one and a half, 
as it happened between the lowest and the next uh, highest order. So you can learn a lot from this kind of exercise. The most naive scale choice is often not, in fact, uh, the best. There's a generic uh, consideration that you can bring here. If you think of how the initial mass uh, gets distributed in terms of energies of the final state particles, you have at least two of them. So you could argue, well, the typical scale of inside the loops is really not the Higgs mass. It's half the Higgs mass, at least, some fraction that, well, doesn't get you where you really want to be, but at least tells you if there was a reasonable scale choice, it's perhaps small, uh, sm it's perhaps uh, rather smaller than uh, the mass uh, rather than larger. But more you cannot say. And uh, you see, sometimes it takes high, high orders uh, to get a, a reasonably uh, uh, good result. That's just a fact of life. And it's not because alpha s is uh, particularly uh, large here, because alpha s at the Higgs mass or half the Higgs mass is a small parameter. It's a tenth or so. But that's what uh, it is. Uh, the last comment I want to make here is, uh, if you want to have an estimate of the uncertainty of your truncated perturbation theory series, then one way of getting such an estimate for very little effort is to say, well, I uh, vary my scale choice around my best guess of the scale choice. And that variation gives me some idea of the uncomputed higher orders. The rational behind that is exactly what I had here. The scale variation of a truncated result is of the uh, generically of uh, the first order that you have neglected, and it might give you an idea of the uncertainty. Works fine for the higher orders uh, in this uh, example. Uh, doesn't work fine for the lowest order unless, by some crazy reason, you said, "Well, my best scale choice is about a fifth of the uh, Higgs mass," where you would have been sitting here. But frankly, uh, I wouldn't know any good reason. Uh, why a fifth of the Higgs mass should be a good scale choice here. So you really see that uh, this is a recipe. It's very often used. And the main reason is often you don't have any better idea of how to estimate the higher order uncertainty. So you do what you can do. And in a way, it's dirt cheap to do because uh, all these logarithms are known and you can just do the exercise without much effort. But you should keep in mind, sometimes it gives you a good estimate. And sometimes, like here, if you started at leading order, it gives you actually a bad estimate. And you shouldn't be surprised. It's just estimation of errors is a very high art. And uh, it's also a matter of luck. And sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. Last uh, point I want to make in this uh, section here is uh, a bit more about quark masses. Remember, not only alpha s, but also quark masses have to be renormalized. And if one takes what is standard in QCD, which is this MS bar scheme, I realize I forgot to say what the MS bar scheme is. Um, so what is the MS bar renormalization scheme? It tells you when you compute uh, these uh, divergent quantities, then you subtract just the pole, the pole terms, the one over epsilon, and a specified finite piece, which is some uh, combination of four pi's and the Euler constant, and the only reason for that is to uh, make sure that what remains in your finite result uh, looks a little bit less messy. So without the bar, the MS scheme would be just subtracting the poles. And for convenience, uh, one subtracts the poles and a little bit uh, more. And that's uh, then called MS bar. And what that little bit more is, is specified, but it's not of interest here. When you do that, then both alpha s and uh, the quark masses uh, depend on that scale mu with the dependence that I've uh, shown you before. Now, if you have heavy quarks, and heavy quarks in that uh, context means anything uh, at whose uh, mass scale the perturbed uh, the alpha s is uh, already reasonably small, charm bottom and top, you can also use the pole mass. Now, pole mass is defined to be uh, the value of the mass at which the quark propagator has its pole in momentum squared at that value. And that's a perfectly fine and perfectly common uh, uh, definition uh, also, for example, in QED for the electron and for the muon. Um, you can do it 
technically also uh, for these heavy quarks, but you can do so only in perturbation theory. And you should realize the pole mass for a heavy quark is not something that you can measure in an experiment like you can measure the electron pole mass. The electron pole mass you get by measuring the mass of the electron as it sits somewhere in your experiment. There is no top sitting somewhere in your experiment, uh, not only because the top decays, but also because uh, the top or the bottom of the charm uh, never uh, exist even for short times as free particles, yeah, they're confined. You see them in hadrons at best before these hadrons decay. Sometimes it's uh, nevertheless used uh, as a, a scheme. And the important thing is if you have two different uh, renormalization schemes, you can always go from one to the other in a controlled fashion. And then uh, you can express one uh, scheme quantity in terms of the other. So this here is the lowest order expression of the pole mass in terms of the MS bar mass. You see it's an expansion in the coupling. Uh, and it comes again with a lock uh, involving uh, here the running uh, scale. And the higher orders, of course, are known because the running of the uh, mass is known and also the pole mass renormalization. Uh, is. So there's something known about these higher orders here. The important thing is if you say, I give you the mass value of the top quark, that's a meaningless statement unless you specify what is the scheme. Now, here are some values. For the light quarks, the pole mass is not useful because it's a perturbative uh, definition and perturbation theory at the scale of the up, down, or strange quark mass makes absolutely no sense. So these are not pole masses, but running masses, and the convention is to give them at scale 2 GeV. You want them at another scale, you use the uh, running and you compute it. For the heavy quarks, uh, a convention uh, to give uh, MS bar masses uh, that is quite uh, common is to use what is called the, the masses with a bar on top. And that is just uh, the solution of an implicit equation. It's the running mass at the scale equal to the mass itself which sounds a bit crazy, but it just means solve this implicit equation. Uh, and that is the value you get. And you see, uh, for example, the top quark running mass, uh, the weather, well, the MS bar top quark mass is something like 160 uh, and something uh, GeV. If you looked at the pole mass instead, you find it's bigger than 170. And that's because there is some correction here. And that's a warning, uh, just giving the mass without the renormalization scheme isn't meaningful. Okay, last uh, comment in this uh, area here is, uh, how do you solve this renormalization equation uh, for the running mass? Well, the trick is exactly the same as I showed you earlier for the beta function. You uh, change uh, variables from mu to alpha s, and then this becomes uh, here, uh, can be rewritten as, differential equation of the mass depending on alpha s. The right hand side depends on alpha s. This can be solved by integration between your initial and final value of the scale or of alpha s. And if you have a specific perturbative expansion uh, to some order of this ratio here, uh, then you can uh, perform this integral and you have an explicit solution. And that will be again shown in the exercises. Um, so that's rather simple. And uh, very nicely, there's many other important RGEs, renormalization group equations, that have exactly the form here, the same form here, except that instead of the mass, there is some other quantity. And we will see one later in a later lecture. And that means what you have learned here, uh, you can then immediately apply uh, to these other cases. So that's uh, the summary of this block. Renormalization sounds like something very technical. And of course, if you actually do it, it is technical. But you shouldn't forget beyond all technical aspect, it reflects a physical idea. This is a, an extremely clever one. And that means eliminate the details of physics at very, very high scales in far ultraviolet uh, compared with the scale of your problem. And uh, this elimination is done uh, exactly by renormalization. The consequence of that is that crucial parameters like the coupling 
become uh, functions of your scale. And uh, the particular form of that dependence, asymptotic freedom at high momenta, strong interactions at low momenta, um, that is a hallmark of QCD. And it uh, introduces the specific mass scale in the theory that you don't see at the Lagrangian level. It really comes in through quantum effects. And practically, it means that whatever you compute in perturbation theory will depend on your choice of scale. You can then have happy debates among theorists what a, a clever choice of scale is. Um, you can use that dependence to estimate even your uncomputed higher order corrections, uh, but it's only an estimate. And sometimes uh, it's a good one, sometimes it is not. So the remaining slides here are the exercises. I don't run through them now because uh, uh, I've mentioned them and you can then see them offline. So um, before I put on the next set of slides, uh, here's your chance to ask any uh, um, uh, quick question about uh, what uh, I have shown you so far. Not, <clears throat> then we need a little technical break uh, for me uh, to um, uh, switch slides. So uh, Sergio, I propose I'll first stop sharing. Okay. Go ahead. Pull my other slides, which takes me a little moment. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm saving this. Next set of slides. Looks good. Now I'm trying to share slides again. That's the tricky bit if Zoom wants me to do that. So, do you see part two? Yes, we do. Miracle. Great. Yes. Didn't work before. It works now. So let's Very go good. on. The next story I'd like to tell you, and the, that's uh, the second part of today, that's uh, also a little bit shorter, is uh, what can we say about this, as I said already, uh, one of the simplest applications of perturbation theory, E plus E minus gonahadrons. There's a lot of to, uh, things to learn here. Um, and where do we start? Well, the observable is the cross section for E plus E minus going to anything, uh, any set of hadrons. And throughout my lectures, I will uh, write a sort of any set of uh, hadrons. I don't care about their details. Uh, that's very often written as an X. So this is not a particle. It stands for a collection of unobserved hadrons. And in a cross section uh, or in a decay, uh, the specification is sum over all hadronic final states, whatever they are. Now this has a part uh, of, its, uh, of uh, this cross-section is uh, QED, namely E plus E minus annihilating into a virtual photon or a virtual Z boson. Uh, and that's not what we are so much interested here in. Uh, so one can take out that part and also a big part of the uh, dependence on the center of mass energy S uh, by dividing this by uh, E plus E minus going uh, to a pair of muons that at tree level has the same graph of fear as here, except that uh, the uh, quark anti quark pair in the uh, final state is replaced then with a muon pair. So, this is just convention, it's very useful. And what you get from measurements, and this is decades of measurements uh, put into one plot, and highly precise, you also see, this ratio varies quite a bit. Here, this is below a GEV. Perturbation theory is not of any help there. <coughs> me. You see resonance peaks uh, of the rho and uh, omega meson, very narrow peak of the phi meson, very broadish, well, call it peak or not, of an excitation of the rho meson. And then at some stage here, starting beyond that rho prime peak, the curve becomes flat as a function of s. Then, whoops, comes a new resonance, charm quark resonances and excited resonances, 
After that, they, these very, very, very sharp peaks, uh, they go through the roof in this plot, uh, you uh, have a new plateau, but at a higher value. Come the uh, same story here uh, with bottom quark uh, BB bar uh, bound states, the epsilon and its friends. And after that, you have again a plateau. What you don't see at the resolution of this plot is there is actually a value, uh, a shift in the plateau value between here and there. But you see it's smaller sh a shift than compared with this one. And then there's more stuff that happens. At some point, you have not only the intermediate photon that's important, but also the intermediate Z until here you see the Z peak. So as I said, the electroweak part of this process you can take off. And then uh, the uh, QCD interesting part is uh, the amplitude for a gamma star or a Z star, star meaning it's virtual, going to hadrons. Amplitude squared gives you the cross section and you sum over all hadrons uh, final state. So this is what we call a fully inclusive final state, not interested in any details here. And what makes it even simpler is that uh, the initial state here has no hadrons at all, zero hadrons. Little side remark, the very same uh, calculations uh, and considerations you can make to uh, apply uh, to a close friend of this process here, and that's the decay of a tau uh, lepton into hadrons. Uh, well, instead of having annihilation here, the tau uh, radiates off a neutrino, you have a virtual W, and the W now, instead of the gamma star or Z star, the W star goes into uh, hadrons. That's what's written here. And you can again normalize it to uh, 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 something here that uh, uh, allows you to take part of, uh, take off part of the uh, dynamics just for convenience. Turns out the calculations you need for this are essentially the same as you need for that. So you get two applications for one single effort. Since this here is uh, computed to very high perturbative order, up to the fourth order, one of these rare cases where you have really many, many, many orders in the perturbation expansion, um, uh, that gives you then a possibility to actually measure alpha s by measuring r, computing these coefficients and solving for alpha s. And that's exactly the point uh, in uh, this uh, plots of data uh, for alpha s I showed you earlier. That is how you get uh, the point at the tau mass. Now, let's go back to the simplest lowest order here. Just, I mean, this is uh, well known from elementary uh, um, uh, lectures, I suppose. At lowest order, where you just have this simple graph here, all that uh, distinguishes uh, uh, the graph with QQ bar from the one with mu mu is the vertex here. And what happens at that vertex is, well, uh, you have uh, um, the electric charge of uh, the quark because it couples to the photon here. Well, this is for the uh, region where the Z, exchange, uh, the, the Z contribution uh, can be neglected. So this couples to the photon. You have the squared electric charge and you have the number of colors in which this quark can be produced. And that's uh, equal to three. And you see, as soon as you have a new quark that you can produce, you get a, a step in this value. And that's exactly what you see here. And that's also why the step when you include charm, which has a square charged four over nine, is a bigger step than the step from charm to bottom, where you have an extra one over nine only. So this is all very nice, very powerful in practice to get alpha s. But let's understand uh, why you can do this in the first place. You measure hadrons. You never see quarks and muons, as this uh, Feynman graph here suggests. So why are you allowed to do that? But the underlying concept here is what is called parton hadron duality. It is a statement, you can call it a hypothesis, that if you compute this inclusive uh, process uh, cross section or squared amplitude uh, for final states that are partons, you should get the same thing as if 
these final states uh, are hadrons, which is what you see uh, in nature. Now, the underlying idea is that uh, the gamma star going to partons is a valid description uh, for, for, short, uh, for short space time uh, in a short, uh, small space time region of order of one over the large scale, which is the square root of s in this case, yeah? the, the number that's given here. So this is one over uh, uh, 10 uh, inverse GeV. So this, if you express it in femtometer, is a small uh, distance or small time. So this is why you can hope that this here gives you a reasonable uh, uh, result. Now, going from partons to hadrons happens at later uh, space time, uh, at a later uh, time. But whatever happens in that uh, time, what is called the process of hadronization, quarks and gluons turning into hadrons, uh, it will not change uh, the final rate. It changes, uh, of course, it, 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 uh, the uh, dynamics of hadronization uh, influences uh, crucially what the final state looks like in your hadrons, but not the inclusive rate. And that's why you can hope to get the inclusive rate uh, from uh, the parton uh, calculation. And that's, as you see here, what actually uh, turns out to give a very accurate and nice description of nature. So this is a good concept. And that motivates us to look a little bit closer at what these alpha s corrections actually are. Now, when you go beyond the tree level, which was gamma star going uh, to uh, q, q bar, you can add a gluon and you can add it either in the final state or you can add it uh, in the amplitude or in the conjugate amplitude. So the way to understand these graphs here is I draw the amplitude on one side and the conjugate amplitude on the other. Uh, they must give you a, the same final state, of course. And that is what you graphically see here, but uh, because these, uh, of course, these lines have to match. And I leave a little gap here because uh, that's really the final state uh, that you have. Sometimes one also draws the line as closed and uh, a little dashed line here. So this first part here is what is called the real corrections with extra partons in the final state. And loop corrections uh, are what is called virtual. And it turns out, well, the virtual corrections have UV divergences. Same story, well, the story that I told you at the beginning of this lecture. But we know how to handle these, so we don't uh, discuss them any further here. However, there is other uh, divergences that you get if you compute this. And these I want to discuss you now uh, with you now because they are as crucial for uh, QCD perturbation theory as the UV divergences. They are called soft or collinear divergences, uh, which respectively uh, correspond to uh, the phase space region where the gluon either radiated to the final state or in the loop here has a four momentum going to zero. That gives you a singular behavior and I'll show you in a little moment uh, how that happens. Another singular region is when uh, the uh, momentum of a gluon uh, stays finite but becomes proportional more or less, approximately proportional to the momentum of the particle that it radiated, which could be the quark or the anti-quark. And the same can happen inside a loop here. Getting a divergent result is a very annoying thing, but it so it turns out that uh, all these uh, divergences cancel if you sum over all possible graphs. That sounds a bit like a miracle, but I'll uh, motivate to you a little later why that happens. First of all, let's uh, take a look at how such uh, singular behavior uh, occurs. So now I try again to make a halfway uh, readable. Uh, right up. Let's consider a very simple case. Start with an off shell quark, momentum P plus Q, that decays into an on shell quark P and an on shell gluon Q. So that means P squared, I said equal to the quark mass, Q squared is equal to the gluon mass square, that is uh, zero. And 
because these are uh, external particles. I don't, well, they're on shell particles. I don't use their propagators. Uh, but imagine that this here comes from uh, some other part of the process. So the graph would continue here in some way, which I don't draw because I'm just interested in this uh, line and that has a propagator. The propagator has a denominator, which is just the four momentum squared minus, because it's a massive quark in my example, the mass squared. So, take the binomial uh, expansion here, p squared is equal to m squared, so this goes away. q squared is equal to naught, it goes also away. So this is equal to two times p dot q. And if I write that out in components, uh, that gives me two zero component of p minus, now I just write this and to define the quantities in a second. Now this should be two times P naught Q naught, which is the first term. And then you have minus uh, the um, scalar product of P momentum, P three momentum times Q three uh, momentum. Now the length of the photon three momentum is equal uh, to its energy because uh, it's uh, an on-shell uh, zero mass particle. Um, whereas P squared here, uh, the, the, the length of the, uh, P vector can of course be expressed uh, in terms of the energy component or vice versa. That means P zero is P vector squared plus MQ squared. And since this was a scalar product uh, between two vectors, um, theta is the angle between P and Q. You realize I've uh, chosen some reference frame here and not told you which one. Uh, in fact, it doesn't matter for the consideration uh, that I want to make. Um, so the first thing you can see here is that this here is always positive. Yeah? This is the energy of an uh, outgoing particle, it's positive. Here the energy is bigger uh, than the momentum component, so this is guaranteed to be positive, but this here can be zero. So this here is equal to zero or bigger. And when it goes to zero, since this is the denominator of a propagator, then you get a, a divergence because uh, then in your Feynman rule, you have uh, something like one over zero and that is divergent. So we can uh, identify the, singular, the singularities just by looking when does the denominator of the propagator in this example go to zero. And we see, well, we have a soft singularity that is when the momentum, the, the energy of uh, the gluon here uh, goes to zero. And because it's on shell in my example, that also means that the four vector goes to zero. Yeah. Because uh, the length, as I said already, uh, the length of the three vector is equal to Q naught. So this is the region of a soft singularity. And uh, I note uh, that if the gluon had a mass, that soft singularity would be absent because then uh, the second term here would have a P vector times length of Q vector. If you have a massive particle, the Q vector length is smaller than Q zero and then this cannot uh, go, that, that cannot become equal to zero. So soft singularities only happen uh, come from a radiation of a zero mass particle, not possible uh, from radiating a, a finite mass particle. That's important uh, as a result. The other possibility uh, for this year to go to zero is only if the quark mass is uh, equal to zero. So these are called collinear and sometimes they're also called mass singularities means the same thing. And these happen for the angle theta going to zero if the quark mass is set to zero. Because then this here is just P naught 
And for theta equal naught, the cosine is one, you get P naught minus P naught. And that is another way of getting zero while Q naught stays finite. So collinear mass singularities only happen if you have compute with massless quarks, whereas the soft singularity is uh, you cannot uh, prevent from happening uh, because the gluon is massless. You could actually also uh, consider the case where you have the same situation with the gluon splitting in two, two gluons, uh, then the equivalent of the quark mass here would be the gluon mass, and then the collinear singularity again happens always. Uh, last uh, little remark, you can do the very same type of consideration. So this was for a, an off-shell particle decaying into two on-shell ones. You can also consider something which is more like a, a scattering process um, when you start <coughs> me, with an on-shell particle uh, P which radiates uh, an on-shell uh, particle Q and uh, a P minus Q uh, here. If you compute now the propagator P minus Q squared minus M squared, you get minus P dot Q instead of plus P Q. Uh, P, uh, dot Q here. And the uh, discussion of the singularities is uh, the same uh, as it was here. So uh, this is not only uh, valid for decay processes, but also for uh, scattering processes. And it is much more generic. These are just the simplest examples where you see uh, what the singular regions are. So let's discuss this a little bit more. We have soft or sometimes also called infrared divergences because uh, we have a massless gauge particle. And the same thing happens actually in QED, where you have soft photons instead of soft gluons. In QED, uh, these uh, divergences are sometimes called the infrared catastrophe, which is a theorist catastrophe, not an experimentalist catastrophe, because experimentalists don't measure infinite uh, results. And we have, in addition, collinear or mass divergences if the quark masses are set to zero. Now, You could ask me why on earth would I set a quark mass to zero since I've shown you before a list of quark mass values and they were all finite. Uh, so certainly for the up down strange quarks, why don't I just put in uh, their finite mass values there and these divergences are gone. Well, the reason is I could formally keep these finite masses for the light quarks, but I know that perturbative results are not trustworthy if virtualities of particles are in the squared MeV region. And that's where alpha S is not even well defined anymore in perturbation theory. So uh, it is just a matter of convenience for the light quarks. And light means light compared uh, with the scale of your process. So if you're computing a process at uh, 5 TeV, you might as well set the charm quark mass to zero as well, because it's tiny compared with what is relevant. But minimally, up, down, and strange quark masses must be set to zero in perturbative calculations. Um, keeping them finite would not give you any physics sense. It would mask uh, the physics more uh, than it uh, would uh, make it uh, clear. And if you do that, you have these collinear uh, divergences. Now, I told you the divergences cancel. And that means, in, uh, in other ways, uh, the result, uh, the, the, the important phase space in these uh, graphs here that dominates uh, the final result, sum over all graphs, uh, is dominated by large virtualities. And that is meaning it's dominated by small space-time distances. And that was exactly my uh, previous hand-waving justification for using parton hadron duality in the first place. So you see how things fit together. Uh, there is some formal names for theorems that uh, tell us when and why um, such divergences cancel. Uh, given the time, I skip over that. You can read it uh, later on if you're interested. Um, important remark to make here is um, what uh, what I said: the the, the cancellation of divergences. Uh, um, can we look a little bit more in detail now? Turns out if you compute uh, the uh, squared matrix elements here, the squared amplitudes, uh, you have uh, two integrations uh, that become uh, 
uh, logarithmically divergent at small values. There's the uh, integral over the photon energy, the gluon energy E, and it has the form dE over E. And there's this integral over the angle of emission, uh, which is d theta over theta. To see why this is di uh, logarithmically divergent, you have to compute more than what I showed here. You have to do the numerator algebra of these graphs. You have to take the squares. Uh, and uh, that's a little bit more work than I uh, have time uh, here to show. But believe me, this is what comes out. So the fully inclusive cross section that I've discussed so far uh, has uh, these um, divergences um, cancel in the sum over all graphs. Now, what happens if you are getting a little bit more curious and say, well, uh, this uh, quark and this gluon and this quark, each of them could go to a hadronic jet and uh, discuss next uh, time what a hadronic jet is. So if in the parton level calculation, I keep the momenta of these guys fixed rather than integrating over everything. Well, keeping them fixed here, I still have this loop integral in the virtual corrections because this here is not observable, doesn't affect the final state here. Uh, and then I have only a partial cancellation of my uh, divergences. So what that means, if uh, you uh, compute something like a jet observable for these graphs, then the uh, computation remembers that, well, first of all, if you do the uh, calculation correctly, next uh, lecture, next week, um, then uh, the uh, diversion part of the integral still cancels and you get a finite result. Uh, but as a reminder of that cancellation uh, happening uh, sort of only partially is that uh, you have squared logarithms in the final result and one squared logarithm uh, for one uh, vertex, that means one order of alpha s, because you have one vertex here, mu squared, it's alpha s, g squared over four pi. Uh, and the, what the uh, argument of the log squared is depends on exactly what kind of kinematic observable you're computing, but that's it's a squared log follows from this uh, structure of one um, logarithmic uh, integral over energy and one logarithmic uh, integral over angle. These are called Sudakov logarithms. And the crucial uh, property of these logarithms is that if you go uh, one order higher, uh, the same story repeats itself. And it's easy to see why. Uh, the, the argument I gave here, uh, you can repeat it. Whenever you uh, have a line here and you radiate a gluon, uh, the same thing happens. So at each order uh, in alpha s, uh, you get an alpha s times a log squared. So coming back to a discussion we had earlier for the renormalization group logarithms, which were always alpha s times a single log, if alpha s times the log is large, you have to what is called technically uh, sum this to all orders. And typically that's done by solving the differential equation, which before was the renormalization group equation. Now you have alpha uh, times a square log. And the origin of this is not the renormalization. It's uh, uh, something different. It comes from this soft collinear integrals. Uh, but if that alpha s times log squared is large, again, you must sum that to all orders uh, to have a meaningful uh, result uh, in your computation. It turns out that can be done analytically by, uh, again, a different uh, differential equation for certain cases. And it is done in an algorithmic way by what is called uh, the parton showers in Monte Carlo event generators, which simply speaking, uh, just put as many of these uh, radiations in here, uh, make appropriate uh, approximations. Uh, and then it's also possible uh, to sum the relevant squared logs to all orders in perturbation theory. Now, if I uh, may, Sergio, I would just uh, wrap up uh, today's lecture uh, with this uh, slide here, uh, which gives us another way of understanding, or uh, one way of understanding uh, why these uh, uh, divergences cancel. And that is the optical theorem. 
Now, you know, hopefully, that the optical theorem allows to compute a total cross section or a squared amplitude uh, as the imaginary part of the amplitude for the incoming state going to itself. And this amplitude for gamma star going to gamma star actually is called vacuum polarization. And the graph for the vacuum polarization is this one here with the gluon and another graph is the same graph. Um, so what this line here, which I can put in different way now means, I look at the final state, it's exactly the same I had here, but now technically uh, cutting this graph in all possible ways, possible ways means uh, topologically and such uh, that the final state particles have a positive energy because otherwise they cannot be physical final state particles. Um, that uh, gives you the imaginary part of the amplitude. So this optical theorem holds both in the full theory where you have hadrons, it also holds in perturbation theory when you have partons in your calculation. And now the idea is where well, the vacuum polarization at large virtuality of your photon, which is the center of mass energy of the uh, annihilation is dominated by short distances. So that's why we can compute it at quark gluon level. Once you have computed that vacuum polarization in perturbation theory, you might as well take its imaginary part and you know that that imaginary part gives you the cross section. Uh, since the vacuum polarization, where you don't even speak about a final state uh, in the first uh, step, uh, is only having one large scale, it's not so surprising uh, that uh, divergences uh, should cancel inside this. And if you take the imaginary part of something finite, it stays finite. So this is a nice way of understanding why sufficiently inclusive quantities via this unitarity or optical theorem trick uh, uh, will have uh, soft and collinear divergences cancel each other. And that is all I wanted to say for today. Next time we will continue at this point and speak a little bit about uh, hydronic jets. Thank you very much. Is there any uh, question for now? Thank you very much, Marcus. Very nice. So, questions for Marcus? <coughs> It's Friday afternoon, everyone is bust, I guess. It's Friday afternoon late. <laughs> so uh, I will send these uh, annotated slides to Sergio. We will put them on very the good. Yeah. Uh, web page of the school. Yeah. Um, Sergio, you, you, you just have to look at the link I sent you earlier. Uh, I saw it, I saw it already. So I will, uh, I will upload them uh, so, whenever, as soon as you put them. Yeah. So you can uh, then uh, take a look at the uh, lectures of today up to this point. Uh, there are no exercises in the second set of slides uh, here. Uh, so all the exercises you should ideally take a look at are in the, at the end of the first set of slides. And uh, as announced, uh, the exercise classes uh, on Monday morning will have Peter and Florian uh, going uh, through these exercises together with you. So you can learn a little bit more and get your hands on experience with uh, the calculations I've shown you today. Yeah, that's very important that you have uh, reminded that. Okay. Uh, so can, can I ask you, can I ask you a, a, a curiosity that, uh, sure, that uh, while listening to you concerning this uh, higher order corrections that yes. uh, their relevance uh, is different for different processes, for different observables. No? Absolutely, yes. And, and uh, I was wondering uh, whether there is uh, a jerarchy there, if, it, if there is a, an argument somehow to, to predict for which, for which observable uh, they, they can be bigger or smaller somehow. There is some, I would say, collected experience from such calculations, which lets you expect uh, to be in a better or in a worse situation. Um, I'll come to that in a later lecture uh, for the factorization part. Great. 
If you're interested in details and in a safe guess, there is none. <coughs> there can be surprises. Uh, the Higgs two hadrons example I showed you, it looked very simple to start with. The single heart scale, a decay process, not a scattering process. Why would the lowest order be such a lousy approximation? Well, it just happens. And you can say, well, maybe it was because the process started at order alpha s squared. Yeah, oh. the, because you need, I, I don't have this, uh, uh, the picture on this set of slides, but let's see, I think I left a little bit of space here. So the Higgs had the top quark loop, then you had minimally two gluons. Yeah. So this is of order alpha uh, s in the amplitude, hence alpha s squared in the observable. And uh, this I showed you the renormalization group logarithms uh, for an observable uh, starting at alpha s squared are already fierce. And oh. it just happens that the non logarithmic part of the higher order is also fierce. And in that case, even worse. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a bit with hindsight that you could say, yeah, maybe you should have expected trouble, but one shouldn't exaggerate. Uh, you always pretend that you knew it before once you knew it afterwards, but there is okay. surprises. Yeah. Very good. So if there are no other questions, I thank Marcus again. Thank you very much. And we will see you on Monday. Very good. And Thanks I close everybody. the session for everybody. And have a great weekend. You too. Thanks a lot. And thanks to the students for their interest and their participation.